It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Welcome back to The Green Rush, the business of cannabis, where we're talking about everything that is psychedelics today on the show. With me on this segment is Robert Laurie, founder of Ad Lusum Law uh, up in BC, British Columbia, Canada. Rob, thanks for being with us. Hey, Josh. Good to be with you again. Yeah, good to see you. Um, so we're just going to jump right in here. Um, wanted to ask you about um, the first time you used psilocybin, and and if you use it now, why? All right, let's break that down. The first time I used psilocybin, and why? Yeah. All right. Well, it probably goes back at least 25 years ago plus. Uh, some buddies said, hey, let's do some mushrooms. And a few of them had done it before. And it was anything but a medical setting. And um, it was a pretty good, pretty good night. I mean, I'll never be able to watch Caddyshack and Fantasia ever the same way ever again. But definitely that was a first step into a, a, a much broader universe, if you will. I mean, the why probably goes back to junior high, high school with regards to reading some pretty interesting books. I and mean, they just happened to be on the St. George's summer reading list in grade 11. And there were some books, including... Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception, and then Brave New World, and uh, what else did we look at? But there was a heavy bent on psychedelics, for example, and certainly in Doors of Perception and um, Brave New World. And in fact, when I met Dennis McKenna the first time, and we've become, I'd say, you have pretty, pretty close friends ever since. He told me you can't totally understand Huxley unless you read The Island in addition to Brave New World, because kind of between those two extremes is, is what Huxley was getting at. So in a nutshell, yeah, it was those books that, you know, reading Doors of Perception and thinking, my goodness, we only use one part of the brain and one part of perception and there's all these other dimensions was an interesting setup for psychedelics. And since then, my involvement has been a little more serious mm -hmm. and Gaddy Jack and uh, Fantasia. A, a lot's happened, you know, with, with cannabis. And then now on the, on the coattails of cannabis, you've got uh, the psychedelic industry. What's one of the most interesting trends you've seen in the space? Well, I don't know if it's really a trend, more of you already have a framework, right? And so it's you mentioned cannabis. And in Canada, the first Section 56 exemption for medical access happened in, in 2001. It was the RV Parker case. And so that kind of set the framework for the first case in what John Conroy QC calls the litany of litigation. And so 15 years later, coupled with Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party's plat electoral platform to legalize election platform and promise to legalize cannabis, coupled with two pretty significant court cases. There was the Allard case and Owen Smith to do with edibles and cannabis and all its forms. So really that 15 years took us from medical access to cannabis right through to a recreational, you can buy it in a store, consume it, legal, no repercussions for, psych or for, for, for that, for cannabis. But if we compare where we are now with psychedelics, maybe we're back where we were in 2001 with cannabis, maybe 2002. I say that because in August 2020, that was, yeah, August 4th. So, yeah, over two years ago, uh, Theracil was responsible for achieving the first Section 56 uh, exemption for psilocybin or access to psilocybin for ther therapeutic purposes. 
And we, we've had some advancements since then. I mean, there's been a number of folks have been have gained admission or access to therapy. It's still very strict and tightly regulated. And you and I probably wouldn't be eligible given our situations or conditions are not extreme enough to say that we have any uh, to be eligible. So where the trend really is, is psychedelics are in an interesting holding pattern, right? I don't think they're going to be legalized like cannabis has anytime soon for anything that resembles recreational purposes. Like think about it, Josh, we're hardly going to meet up next year and be able to legally walk into a store and buy psychedelics. Now you can illegally in Vancouver, that's a separate conversation, but I think to, to cut to the chase here, you know, the, the rules are already really written for psychedelics because they're, they are going to be treated very much like a pharmaceutical. And so we already have the pharmaceutical avenues for research, scientific endeavors, plus the fact that let's take mescaline, MDMA, LSD, uh, synthetic synthesized psilocybin. I mean, all of these things are already in the public domain. So that then leaves drug development and Drug development has always been there. So where are we and what are the trends? Well, I think <laughs> the trend is that psychedelics is running out of room to maneuver. More people are realizing like, hey, this isn't quite like the next cannabis. Different frameworks, different pathworks to legalization. And due to the fact that anyone that's doing any serious work is advocating at the diametric opposite end of the access scale from anything that looks like irresponsible, non-medical, done in a clinical setting environment. So that that those are the trends. And I think the US is certainly leading some of the efforts, certainly in Denver and with um, with Oregon's therapeutic initiative. So from where I sit, sit, I think it's interesting because these initial models are kind of like the canaries and the coal mine, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Happy to share more on that point. I'm curious. So I was gonna I was gonna make an analogy to the cannabis industry, but you said it's gonna be more akin to the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So mm -hmm. if if it does follow the pharmaceutical industry. What are some of the challenges that psilocybin companies are going to face, like regulation and crop insurance and supply chain? Well, hold on. The problem for anybody in this space, and let's just even include cannabis back into the mix, like, great, you've got state level legalizations, right? Canadians will tell you what a pain in the ass it is to go down to the states and try to buy weed because unlike at home, where it is legal and you can use a credit card and certain legal outlets have been able to transition over onto legal and international banking frameworks. Now it's hard. Even legal companies are finding it difficult to get signed up with banks and insurance and that's cannabis, right? Psychedelics on the other hand, um, because of the fact that the, three main international conventions still exist. That means just like cannabis, we're still limited traditionally to scientific and research purposes, medical access and scientific research. Cannabis, Canada being the first G7 country, again, think of us like Canada, like one big state. Sure, we've got, you know, 10 provinces and three territories, but because we're federally legal, it's kind of like Canada's one big state, if you will. However, there's nothing from Canada getting shipped across the border. It's not like you can buy legal Canadian rec weed at a legal Washington state recreational store because technically and on the books, it's still illegal under international law. So that's, think of it, that's the big wall 
that these planes, which are like psych psychedelic companies, which are literally like airplanes, they're just flying into these walls and these walls haven't changed. They've, in the case of psychedelics, been around since 1971, 1972. So until the deck is unstacked, and that really is where we're at with controlled drugs and substances legislation, which was largely brought in by the Nixon administration and has been championed internationally by the US federal government. Until those laws are changed, it's very limited, the legal applications and instances where psychedelics, even for therapeutic purposes, will be legal. And so that rollout and what that ultimately looks like, where it's then recognized by the U.S. federal authorities as a, a legal going concern, I mean, that'll be interesting. Canada is a little further ahead on some of those fronts where they've granted access to, I think, about 63 folks yeah. under the Section 56. And again, that's a ministerial exemption. So the Minister of Health technically can say, OK, that person's so sick and ill and, yeah. you know, the need and the requirement is there. They can grant an exemption to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act for that individual and their physician to possess psilocybin and that's just it where are they getting it from right there's been recently a couple or a few companies that have popped up that are providing legal naturally growing psilocybin mushrooms if you will but there's also labs who've got licenses to provide uh you know eup uh gm eu gmp grade synthetic psilocybin so again, the, the, the abilities and the access points are there, but for the masses to be able to actually get into these, these, you know, these therapies and clinics, it, there's a lot of challenges, like costs. You know, I'm hearing rumblings that some of these psilocybin treatments are as high as $7,000, which is wow. nuts, right? Certain... Um, corporate insurance plans will cover the cost, but because it's at a very new, I don't call experimental stage, but you know, it's at its infancy, these costs are quite high still, even for ketamine therapy. I mean, vets, I know a lot of vets who've been getting access to ketamine and anywhere from 6,000 to $3,000 is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. where you're hearing people doing it in unregulated, you know, the black market for like $500 to $1,500. So it's not a question of access and availability. I mean, all of these things have been there. The real challenge is how are companies going to be able to get privileges or first mover advantage to do something that pharmaceutical companies technically could be doing and I suspect some have been doing since the 70s, but really other than drug development or trying to patent and enforce your patents on a therapy protocol, most of these things already exist. So caveat emptor, buyer beware, I'd say in the, the psychedelic space, because yeah, um, yeah, it, I think to compare it to cannabis is, Correct in some regards, but as indicated, not quite there in others. Does that make well, sense? Does that agree? Or I mean, am I coming at you completely out of left field here? No, I think that I think that makes sense. Um, from the standpoint of, of cannabis, we we've been all talking about, you know, the you talked about EU GMP certification, and we talk about grass generally recognized as safe. What are you seeing? Um, or, or hearing that's being done to increase the quality of the products and making them re recognized industry-wide as quality, stable, safe, and working on a grass designation? Well, it's a good question because, uh, you know, usually these things are a bit of a work in progress. Now, Canada has fairly comprehensive and a very strict framework. I mean, it 
the people that were behind drafting the Cannabis Act, and this is something I think the U.S. is going to learn the hard way, they drafted this with product liability litigation in mind. I mean, just look at how litigate litigious the U.S. is by comparison. You know, people burn their mouths on a coffee in McDonald's and get like, you know, $700 million or whatever. It's crazy. You know, Canadian lawyers hear <laughs> about like what, what Florida lawyers pull in on personal injury. And it's like, man. Um, so all that being said, um, it, it, it's it it's going to be tough because like cannabis, how do you differentiate your product? And in Canada, because these standards and regulations are almost more suitable for a pharmaceutical company than an agricultural business, it's done with regards to trying to avoid and mitigate like masses of people suing. Right. And so that's where you look at it and think, hmm, you know, could I have done it better? Well, from a product liability litigation standpoint, no. And it's another reason how you can only buy prepackaged cannabis, um, which is already pre sealed, prepackaged, because it then avoids, you know, breaks in the chain of causation between interfering and tampering between the ultimate consumer getting it and it leaving the producer's, you know, yard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're going to be standards, but do the standards in the U S are they as high? Um, arguably no, from what I've heard when it comes to issues like mildew or pesticide use or, you know, acceptable thresholds of unsafe. And I mean, those, all of those things are going to have to, Unify because again, you seem to have variable standards, certainly between Washington State versus Oklahoma or California versus Oregon, for example. They all seem to have this patch quilt of different standards and different models, and how that all plays out, we'll see. This is a part where I ask you to pull out your crystal ball for some predictions uh, and looking at synthetic versus natural. Um, the question is, how do you produce enough product without compromising quality? Is natural better than synthetic? And which method is the most cost effective? I mean, well, I think synthetic is the most cost effective, and that's probably what we're going to end up seeing. But I want to get your take. It's a very multifaceted issue. Because the other dynamic that is in there that a lot of people don't really talk about when it comes to psychedelics is conservation. Um, with conservation, I mean, you've got peyote cacti species that are threatened of being wiped out through over harvesting. And as Dennis McKenna says, if everybody goes to the jungle, what's going to happen to the jungle? Right. And that's effectively you're seeing that because psychedelics are so popular, um, there's a you know huge demand for rare sacred herbs and plant and other fungi. And so that that the bigger issue is is well, what are we doing to ensure that you know we don't consume and wipe out the lineage of of these plants and fungi? And so as to if one's better than the other, I mean, I think from a therapeutic point of view, they can achieve both the same thing. But when you talk to people that have been trained in a lineage of, of, of shamanistic plant medicine, there definitely is a spirit in the plant, which is said to have been lost in the, in, in the synthetic uh, lab produced forms. Uh, cost, well, there's no question that a lab produced synthetic will be cheaper on, on a number of fronts. And plus you're going to have minimal batch variation and less likely of contaminated bad batches and, 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 and so on. So really, I think, you know, we need to have a system that allows for different modes of access, depending on 
what is the purpose and the intention and uh, the the ultimate goal because it you know one size fits all when it comes to psycho spiritual therapy uh with a psychedelic component you know i think there's going to need to be multiple avenues mm -hmm. my crystal ball is we're going to get nowhere too fast and when we get there we're going to have to pick up the pace yeah, it's look, none of this is new. It's just new to you is what I tell most people mm -hmm. and trying to take something that existed off grid that was on grid before and now fit it into Western medicine and um, accepted psychiatric practice. Man, this is where worlds collide. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. I think it'll be great for the lawyers insurance companies will have their work cut out for them and ultimately this is going to be a good thing because it'll mean more hopefully more people who are struggling with depression and other ailments will be able to help get the help they need because nothing's worse than you know being able to see avenues of change without being able to access those avenues of change U.S. military suicides are at the highest they've been in 80 years and, and 22 per per day or 22 per minute, whatever it was, was 22 too many uh, that were dying. Um, and this could help definitely. So if people are interested, whether in the U.S. or Canada, and they want to get a hold of you at Ad Lusum Law and talk to you about cannabis or uh, magic mushrooms, the psychedelic industry, how can they get a hold of you, Rob? Yeah, my battery is just about to die here. Perfect I'm timing. Holiday. So you can reach me, direct number 604-218-1084. And my email, you can reach me at rob at adlusumlaw.com. Just Google Robert Laurie, L-A-U-R-I-E, adlusumlaw, that's A-D-L-U-C-E-M. Adlusum means to or toward the light in Latin. New website up, so you should be able to find me, no problem. Thanks cool. for having me, Josh. Good You're welcome. You. We're going to go towards the light, meaning we're going to get out of here. It's the weekend. Appreciate it, Rob. Uh, everybody else, have a great weekend. We're out of here. Uh, that's it. See you, see you next Friday. Coming up on We Talk News this week, the sentence is in. Brittany Griner gets nine years in a Russian prison for possessing cannabis vape cartridges. Now, she's not the only pro athlete in trouble with the law. NBA journeyman Iman Shumpert gets busted at the Dallas airport for carrying over six ounces of weed through security. And President Biden's daughter-in-law visits a legal dispensary in California and draws more ire for her famous father-in-law in the White House. And Massachusetts gets its first changes to the cannabis law and the industry applauds. Plus, check out Forbes magazine this month. Burner, the founder of Cookie's Dispensary Franchise, becomes the first CEO in cannabis to make it to that cover. Cannabis news from coast to coast on We Talk News with Elena Pinto, next. This media original content is supported by Revolutionary Clinics, Massachusetts' number one medical dispensary where the patient comes first. And by Accounting Buds, CPA services for the cannabis industry. And by stylighting.shop. Log on today to get your grow kit. We are Pro Cannabis Media. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. And check out these other videos that we've got.